Do you remember what you were doing when you were 21? In 1995, a 21-year-old released an album that was expected to sell just enough copies to fund her next record. Instead, this album hit number one all over the world, won four Grammys that year, and has sold over 33 million copies. And this 21-year-old just happened to be from Ottawa. Today, we're going to look at one of the most influential albums of the 90s, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. Welcome to the Stewie Tune Show. These are insights and commentary on the music and musicians that shape our lives. And now, let's go back to class with your host, Tony Stewart. All right, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. If you're one of my loyal listeners, I hope you will enjoy this new format. I've got an exciting season here for you. i got some great interviews lined up and some uh, very, very interesting episodes planned for you. If you're a new listener, uh, feel free to go back and check out Season 1. Those first 10 episodes were all rock and roll stories, very short, 10 minutes or less, dealing with some fascinating topics, including the Beatles, Elvis, Sister Rosetta Tharp, a very twisted story about Graham Parsons, and more. So, you know, feel free to go check those out. To say that Jagged Little Pill was a huge album would be the understatement of the year. Confession time. When this album first came out in 1995, I hated it. I remember my wife's younger sister playing it and I was thinking, what on earth is that? I just didn't get it at the time, but it's now uh, one of my favorite albums. I can listen to it constantly. It's, it was just so far ahead of its time, but uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today because Jagged Little Pill turned 25 a few weeks ago. To get a better sense of how Jagged Little Pill appeared to just come out of nowhere, we should take a few moments and discuss Alanis Morissette's background. She was born on June 1, 1974 in Ottawa, Ontario. Her parents were teachers. Her father was a principal, in fact, and they both taught at uh, military schools. So she ended up going to Lard, Germany for a little while, but returned to Ottawa when she was six. She's got two brothers, one of them's her twin. And when she was in middle school, she appeared on a well-known Canadian TV show called You Can't Do That on Television. I'm sure many of you listening to this will remember that show. Her first two albums were released only in Canada. They were dance pop albums, and she did achieve some popularity. In fact, at one point she had earned the nickname the Debbie Gibson of Canada. If you're of a certain age like me, you'll remember Debbie Gibson. If not, uh, look her up. Her second album did end up winning her a Juno Award. Uh, For any American listeners out there, think of the Junos like uh, Canada's version of the Grammys, and uh, then you'll understand. So, she won a Juno for the Most Promising Artist in 1992. Her contract with MCA Canada was for two records, and keep in mind this was while she was in high school. The second album performed fairly well, and of course she won that Juno, but MCA Canada made the decision not to renew her contract, and so she was left without a record label in her senior year of high school. Her folks realized that if she was going to pursue this career, she couldn't stay in Ottawa, so at the end of high school, they helped her pack up and move to Toronto. Even though MCA Canada made the decision to drop her, her publisher at the time continued to work with her and finally ended up putting her in touch with Glenn Ballard. I'm going to be talking about Glenn Ballard in a minute because uh, he was a major part of this story. And as soon as she met Ballard, her fortunes changed forever. So Glenn Ballard is an American uh, producer and songwriter. And he uh, was mostly known before he uh, worked with Alanis Morissette. He had worked with Michael Jackson on a couple of albums, Bad and Dangerous. Uh, He's a co-writer of the song Man in the Mirror. Ballard also worked a lot with film composer Alan Silvestri. 
and the two uh, won a Grammy Award in 2006 for their work on the animated film Polar Express. When you look over the list of who Glenn Ballard has collaborated with, uh, it's a massive list, and I'm going to go over some of the more prominent names here. Uh, so I'm looking, he's worked with Ringo Starr, Stevie Nicks, Wilson Phillips, Miley Cyrus, Katy Perry, Annie Lennox, I mean, tons of them. It's great. The Goo Goo Dolls, of course, Alanis, um, and then Van Halen is on there. Lisa Marie Presley, he helped uh, her with her album uh, back in 2003. Christina Aguilera, so I mean, a pretty big who's who. And Dave Matthews Band is on there, No Doubt is on there. Uh, Aerosmith and Van Halen, I'm, I'm keeping scrolling here, that's why I'm calling more names. So that gives us some context. He's worked with a lot of people as either a producer, a lyricist, or a songwriter. He's very well known in the industry, and uh, this seemed to be a perfect pairing when he met Alanis Morissette. Despite the fact that she is uh, 21 years his junior, uh, looking back, Ballard said that they uh, connected instantly in terms of songwriting and they meshed right away. They were able to start getting to work in the studio almost immediately and she had a lot of ideas and uh, he knew that there was going to be something special coming out of this project. This looks like a good spot for our first break. All right, let's take a music history moment. For today's musical moment, we're going all the way back to June 22nd, 1981. On that day, Mark David Chapman pleaded guilty for the murder of John Lennon. As you may recall, on December 8th, 1980, Chapman murdered John Lennon outside of his apartment in New York City. Chapman was sentenced 20 years to life and has been denied parole 10 times over the years. He's up for parole again this year and I expect the result will be no different. And that's today's Music History Moment. Now, back to the show. When you look back at a lot of great albums, one thing that they seem to have in common sometimes is that they're inspired by a flurry of activity. Ideas just seem to flow out and uh, happen very, very quickly. And that's what, exactly what happened with Jagged Little Pill. In 1994, Alanis and Ballard started recording the demos for Jagged Little Pill. It was just the two of them at first, and they would play all the parts, and then uh, Ballard had a drum machine there, and they would record the songs as they were being written. They would try to record one song a day, and sometimes they'd be in the studio for 16-hour sessions. As a professional musician, I can tell you that that does happen more often than you think. You just need to get the, those ideas out once the inspiration hits you, and that's exactly what happened with them. At these recording sessions at Glenn Ballard's home studio, they would only do one or two takes per song. And in fact, after these uh, recordings were sent to a professional studio for further work, the vocals that were used on the album were the ones that Alanis had done at Ballard's place. Looking back later on, uh, on this recording project, the one thing that Ballard uh, kept emphasizing was, first of all, how much fun they had making the songs, how well they connected as songwriters, and just how busy they were, uh, because there were so many ideas that Alanis had that uh, she knew exactly what she wanted, and she also knew what she didn't want on this album. It was really important to her that every track on this album be authentic and from her heart, and uh, she didn't want any phoniness on there. So we're going to take a look at four songs from the album, Three out of these four were singles that were released, and the other one, Perfect, is just an interesting song, in my opinion, that bears some discussion. So here we go. The lead single off of Jagged Little Pill was You Oughta Know. And uh, the story behind this, again, I was mentioning earlier, expectations for this album were uh, modest. But KROQ-FM in Los Angeles was the station that really got this whole phenomenon kicked off. They put this song in heavy rotation, and uh, it, it just got picked up and, and really drew a lot of attention towards this album and got the whole ball rolling. One notable aspect of this song is that... Um, Dave Navarro played uh, guitars, and um, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers played bass. And I remember uh, hearing, and I believe it was on CBC, a documentary about this um, 
album that they were working in studio and kind of heard Ballard and uh, Alanis uh, working away and were interested. And according to Navarro and Flea, uh, when they laid down these tracks, they didn't really have much to go from. It was a very kind of organic recording process. And all they had to work with was Alanis' vocal track. And they kept on jamming until they found something that really fit. So that's an interesting little story about this song. You Oughta Know deals with an ex-boyfriend and has some pretty explicit lyrics in there. So there were a couple of versions of this, uh, one radio-friendly version and then the other, the version on the album. There was a lot of speculation about who the ex-boyfriend is because the song's pretty uh, spiteful. But uh, some names that have been trotted forward include uh, Dave Collier, the uh, comedian, Mike Peluso, who was a hockey player for the New Jersey Devils, Matt LeBlanc from Friends, um, and Leslie Howe, who was a musician and the producer of Morissette's first two albums in the early 90s. Morissette herself uh, has never said who it is, and here's a quote from her. She said, Well, I've never talked about who my songs were about, and I won't, because when I write them, they're written for the sake of personal expression. So with all due respect to whoever may see themselves in my songs, and it happens all the time, I never really comment on it because I write these songs for myself not other people. This song was a huge hit and uh, was nominated for three Grammy Awards. It won two of them. It won for Best Rock Song and Best Female Rock Vocal Performance, but it lost the uh, Grammy Award for Song of the Year to Kiss from a Rose by Seal. To me, this song was the perfect choice to uh, get things started with his album. The combination of the lyrics, the mystery around the ex-boyfriend, that great groove by uh, Navarro and Flea, and uh, Alanis's vocals, of course, uh, just make for an excellent song to really capture attention because it just stood out uh, in the landscape at the time. I'm pretty sure that this was the first song that I heard from that album uh, 25 years ago, and I remember not liking it at the time, as I mentioned in the intro. Of course, now uh, I'm a big fan, and uh, it's funny how history does that and how when you catch up to a song, I, that's how I like to think about it, is catching up to the song, because it was really ahead of its time. This song ended up peaking at number three on Billboard's rock charts, but for the alternative chart, it hit uh, number one, so it right out of the gate, it drew a lot of attention to this album. Immediately after You Oughta Know on the album, the next song is called Perfect, and it's a ballad, and... Um, I remember just how much that juxtaposition between the two styles really stood out for me. Uh, Perfect is a great song. It's all about pushy parents and uh, worth a listen. It was not, you know, one of the most popular tunes on the album, but uh, still one of my favorites, actually. Despite its understated nature, this is one of the most powerful songs on the album. If you listen carefully to the words, the lyrics at the very end go something like this. We'll love you just the way you are, if you're perfect. That's certainly a sad commentary on the pressure that we as parents often put on our children, and it's a good reminder not to try to live vicariously through them. I'm not going to talk about every song on the album, but I am going to discuss two more. So let's look at Ironic. This was one that uh, Ballard said later that he and Morissette just wrote uh, so quickly, the ideas just came. And here's a quote from him. He said, uh, Oh God, we were just having fun. I thought, I don't know what this is, what genre it is. Who knows? It's just good. And he's right. It is a good song. Uh, one of the uh, funnier things about this song is that the title is called Ironic, but the press was all over it. And so uh, were the language police out there uh, because they said, those examples that are used in the song are not actually irony. So things like uh, rain on your wedding day are not actually uses of irony. If you look at the dictionary definition of irony, it's a figure of speech in which the intended meaning is the opposite of that expressed by the words used. So what Morissette said about writing this song, she said, For me, the great debate on whether what I was saying in ironic was ironic wasn't a traumatic debate. I'd always embrace the fact that every once in a while I'd be the malapropism queen, and when Glenn and I were writing it, we definitely were not doggedly making sure that everything was technically ironic. 
Now, to me, it's always been a sign that you've made it when somebody like Weird Al Yankovic uh, parodies you. And indeed, Weird Al uh, took a shot at this song. Uh, he wrote a song called Word Crimes, and he references Ironic in that song. And he actually has um, a scene of a fire truck burning, which is ironic, versus Rain on Your Wedding Day, which is just coincidence. Regardless, uh, this song is worth listening to because it really showcases the wide range of Alanis's vocal styles. At the beginning, uh, very childlike and innocent and quickly turns to rage. And in the video as well, she's uh, playing several characters, really fascinating song. So uh, again, well worth a listen. I think the song is ahead of its time, just like You Ought to Know was. Now, before we go to break, I'm going to talk about one more song on this album. There are several other uh, singles that were on there that charted uh, really well, but I don't want to talk about all of them today. So let's take a look at uh, Hand in My Pocket. For me, Hand in My Pocket is one of the bigger earworms on this album. I constantly get that song stuck in my head, and I find myself either humming it or singing little snippets. Believe it or not, Hand in My Pocket was Alanis' first number one hit in Canada. Around the rest of the world, it charted pretty well, but certainly not as high as You Oughta Know did. So the instrumentation on this is a little sparser. It's a little bit of a lighter song, very hopeful. Uh, and again, the, the one thing that sticks out is just how big of a vocal range Alana's had on this album. Uh, amazing. And uh, give this one a listen. Uh, I apologize in advance if it gets stuck in your head like it does for me. So these are just a few of the songs off the album, but uh, really... All of them are worth mentioning. Um, the vocal treatment in particular in All I Really Want, her delivery, uh, that really influenced a lot of people who came after her. Well, this looks like a good time for our second break in the show. During this break, I'm going to introduce a new segment called the Stewie Tunes Quiz. This is something that I'm going to have all guests on the show do. And you as a listener can also submit your answers if you'd like. You can either contact me through social media or, of course, you can email the show, stewytunes at outlook.com. It's five questions and it uh, just gives us a little insight into some of your musical tastes. So here are the five questions. And since this is the first edition of the quiz, I'll give you my answers today. But feel free to write in. I'd love to hear what you have to say. All right. Question one, who is your favorite Beatle? Well, for me, uh, this is George Harrison. Um, the older I get, the more I realize just how underappreciated George Harrison was as both a songwriter and as a guitarist and as a member of the Beatles. Um, some of my favorite Beatles tunes are George Harrison tunes, and so I've got to say that he's my favorite. Question two is, name the best show you've ever seen. Well, I can remember this one pretty clearly. I was at a Hawksley Workman concert, and Hawksley is one of those guys, very, very theatric on stage. Believe it or not, the best live show I've ever seen was in Almont, Ontario, where I live. Hawksley Workman came and just did an astounding show, and I remember everyone in the audience thinking, it was a collective thing, that's what makes live music so great. It was a collective feeling like, please don't let this show be over. You know, just one more song, one more song. It was an incredible experience and one that I'll never forget. I've seen Hawksley a few times and I've been to a lot of live shows, but man, that, uh, that evening was just over the top in terms of how magical it was. Question three, who is the most overrated musical artist in your opinion? This is not gonna be a popular one, but uh, for me, Kiss. Um, Although I enjoyed some of the songs, not the greatest band in my opinion. I'm not going to elaborate too much, but I'd say, for me, they're the most overrated musical artist. Question 4. Who is the unknown or underappreciated musician who you think everybody should know about? Well, this one for me is easy. I am a huge fan of a lady named Diane Birch. I first ran across her on the show Live from Daryl's House, which if you've never seen, just look it up on YouTube, fabulous show. But she came on that show and astounded everybody. And this was a room full of seasoned professionals and uh, lovely singer, very talented songwriter. Uh, and for some reason, her career just hasn't taken off the way I thought it would. So look up Diane Birch and uh, you won't be disappointed. And finally, question five, 
If you could invite one musician or band over for dinner, who would it be and why? Well, for me, this is a pretty easy answer. Uh, it would be Billy Joel. I'm a huge Billy Joel fan, and I'd love to just hear what he has to say about all the different songs that he's written. I've heard that he's a very approachable guy, so he's probably the kind of guy that you could serve beer with dinner instead of wine, and he'd be quite happy. And if I had to pick a number two for having over for dinner, I think somebody like Frank Zappa would be fascinating to have over at your house for a meal because you just never know what he's going to say and what he's going to come up with. So that would be another interesting dinner guest. So that's it for today's Stewie Tune Show quiz. Feel free to write in if you'd like to provide some responses. I'd love to hear what you have to say. And now let's move on to the final segment of the show. For our final segment of the show, now that we've had 25 years since Jagged Little Pill's release, we're going to take a look at the aftermath and the legacy of this iconic album. The most important legacy of Jagged Little Pill, in my opinion, is what it did in allowing other solo female artists who followed to have an opportunity and a voice. People like Shakira, Tracy Bonham, Meredith Brooks, Pink, Michelle Branch, of course, fellow Canadian Avril Lavigne, all of them were able to have their opportunities because of what Jagged Little Pill accomplished. Alanis didn't just open the doors, she kicked them down and took names. Here's what Katy Perry had to say. Jagged Little Pill was the most perfect female record ever made. There's a song for anyone on that record. I relate to all those songs. They're still so timeless. I'm not a Katy Perry fan, but I agree with what she said wholeheartedly. Of course, I could never end this episode without doing a rundown of all the records that she set with his album and the many awards won, so here we go. Are you ready? It's a pretty exhaustive list. Jagged Little Pill debuted in the charts at number 117, but it peaked at number one three months later in October of 1995. In that year alone, it was certified 16 times platinum. What that means is that 16 million shipments of that album were made. Here in Canada, the album was certified double platinum that year, which means 2 million copies were sold in 1995. It ended up spending over 220 weeks in the charts worldwide, and that's, that's an amazing feat in itself. As of right now, at least 33 million copies of this album have been sold. Alanis was the youngest artist at the time to ever be certified platinum. So let's talk about those awards. Here in Canada, at the Juno Awards in 1996, she won six Junos, including Album of the Year, Single of the Year, for You Ought to Know, Female Vocalist of the Year, Songwriter of the Year, and Best Rock Album. At the Grammy Awards that year, she won for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance, Best Rock Song, Best Rock Album, and Album of the Year. Jagged Little Pill can be found on many uh, best album lists as well, including uh, it's in Colin's, Colin Larkin's all-time top 1,000 albums, number 51. Rolling Stone ranked it number 31 on its Women in Rock, the top 50 essential albums list. And in 2003, when they published their 500 greatest albums of all time list, it's ranked in there as well at number 327. When the album peaked at number one on the Billboard Top 200, Alanis Morissette became the first Canadian woman to ever top that chart, so that's also a milestone. As I said earlier in the show, I've always felt that Jagged Little Pill was ahead of its time, and when you look back at reviews of the album from 1995 and 1996, the reviews are certainly mixed. I mean, there's some great ones, but there's also some ones that are highly critical, um, complaining about Alanis' vocal style or complaining about the accompaniments. And that makes total sense, as this was something new and out of the blue a little bit, and uh, I don't think people were quite prepared for it. To mark the album's 10th anniversary, in 2005, Alanis released Jagged Little Pill Acoustic, and a special 20th anniversary edition of the album was released in 2015. And for those of you who still like to buy your music in physical form, there's good news. It was just announced this week, actually, that Alanis is re-releasing this album again, a 25th anniversary edition. And along with all the songs from Jagged Little Pill itself, she's also enclosing a live show that she did earlier this year in London, so that should be a fantastic record. The problem with releasing a generation-defining album like Jagged Little Pill is that expectations for the follow-up are huge. 
Her next album, Supposed Former Infatuation Junkie, sold well and was received fairly well by critics, but it didn't do near the kind of numbers or have the same kind of impact as Jagged Little Pill did. This seems to be pretty typical in the music business when you think back about landmark albums and their follow-ups. Jagged Little Pill was the voice of a generation, and 25 years on, it still reverberates. Well, we're coming to the end of the show. I'm glad you were able to join me today, and I hope you enjoy the new format. The music for today's episode was written by my good friend and musical partner, Rick Denis. Our next episode is going to feature an interview with local Ottawa musicians, Double Experience. I think you're going to enjoy that. They're great guys. If you're enjoying this show, please consider leaving a rating and a review. And of course, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, just so that you get updates about new episodes. In the meantime, stay healthy, be well, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Stewie Tune Show. If you're enjoying this show, don't forget to click subscribe.